Good. Uh, thanks again for the uh, intro, uh, Karina. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, as Karina said, uh, I'll, a brief introduction. Uh, I'm uh, I'm Duncan. I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, I've been at Red Hat uh, for almost 10 years now in uh, in various roles, and currently a, a product manager in the application services division. But I started out in uh, consulting, actually middleware consulting uh, around a lot of the JBoss. Uh, uh, products, so enterprise application platform, uh, BRMS, data grid, um, uh, messaging systems, and so forth. And that was when I came across uh, this uh, this I think hidden gem in 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 our Red Hat portfolio, but uh, in general in the open source community called OptiPlanner. And so I became sort of an SME on the OptiPlanner project as well. I've been delivering trainings uh, across the globe on OptiPlanner, doing presentations, and uh, a a a commit here and there on the uh, on the on the code base whenever uh, uh, Jeffrey uh, was so kind to actually accept my PRs. So what we're going to talk about today is um, in my my Red Hat journey, I've I've uh, worked with a lot of of customers, with a lot of clients, and uh, especially in my in my consulting days. And the interesting part, I think, is is the, the sort of things I learned during those OptiPlanner projects when going to customers that had embarked on an OptiPlanner project, uh, got stuck or, or needed help to get more value out of, out of OptiPlanner itself. And from those experiences, I've collected a number of I think common topics or common patterns that, that, that we've seen almost at every customer that could um, really inhibit uh, you making the progress with OptiPlanner that you want. So OptiPlanner is, is a Great project. It's 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 awesome technology, and and it can provide you with a lot you and your organization with a lot of value. But if you don't make the right choices and the right decisions, and 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 think about the right architecture and ask the right questions from day one, you can get yourself into a situation where you you don't get out of OptiPlanner what 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 you want or, or what is actually what you're able to get out of OptiPlanner. So. That's what we're going to talk about today. I'll give a brief introduction for the people. I, I, I assume that everybody, because they're signing up for OptiPlanner, we, uh, has a basic understanding of what OptiPlanner is. Given that this is a more of a high-level overview and not a, a deep dive, as Karina pointed out, uh, I just want to give you a high-level overview of, of what OptiPlanner is aims to do what it tries to do uh, and what problems it tries to solve and after that we'll go into uh, a number of uh, uh, areas of uh, that you need to take care of when starting or embarking on an OptiPlanner project. So first of all what's a planning problem? So OptiPlanner is a, a library, a platform, a utility to uh, a, a, a technology uh, to uh, find optimal solutions or, or best solutions for a what we call non-solvable problems within a given uh, time frame and with a given within a given set of resources. So the first question then arises: What's a planning problem? And basically, a planning problem consists of three things. Uh, first, you want to optimize goals, and we will, can discuss later what those goals can be. But you want to optimize goals uh, with limited resources. Uh, under constraints. So the limited resources is important because if you have unlimited resources like unlimited money, unlimited cars, unlimited uh, cargo space, you don't really have a problem, right? So you have to deal with limited resources. And the under constraints part is 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 uh, important because problems, solutions to problems, there there are usually various constraints. For example, if you look at vehicle routing, uh, a, a driver cannot drive a truck 24 hours a day. So there's constraint there. There, a, a, a certain truck can only carry a certain load of cargo. So there is a constraint there. Uh, people are not allowed to work more than five consecutive days uh, from uh, government law and regulation. So there's a constraint there. So those are the three main concerns in, an, in a planning problem. Optimize goals, limited resources under constraints. So the value proposition of OptiPlanner, if we look at a number of examples to show the value proposition, for example, look at, if we look at the vehicle routing problem, we can see, and Yuri is gonna talk about this problem in more detail in the next session, so make sure to attend that one as well. Uh, 
um, the 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 goal here in vehicle routing could be it could be multiple actually it could be to minimize fuel consumption it could be to minimize driving time it could be to minimize the required vehicles it could be to be more environmental friendly be to because you're using uh, less fuel and so forth uh, then the resources in this problem could be vehicles and deliveries and they have a capacity in fuel and constraints could be uh, as I said, you can have only have eight hours consecutive driving time, or you have to arrive before the due time. For example, in package delivery, if you said you you'll deliver the package before 4 p.m., you have to deliver it before 4 p.m. And as I said before, vehicles can have a certain capacity. So that's an example of different goals, resources, and constraints for this specific problem. If you then look at what OptoPlanner offers, is that based on real benchmarks? So we 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 compete a lot with OptoPlanner in in academic competitions, and we do a lot of benchmarks marking on the platform as well. What you can see that is that based on, on real benchmark uh, uh, values, we can see that versus traditional algorithms, we can improve driving time, for example, in the vehicle routing problem by 15%. Now, 15% might not sound much, but if you have a business that um, spends multi millions of dollars or euros or yen or whatever currency your country is using on uh, uh, shipping goods and, and, and routing goods using vehicles, then saving 15% of a multi multi-million expense is, 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 is significant. And the interesting, the other interesting part is that all the planners usually sort of presumed as being sort of a niche uh, 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 product. But what's interesting is, is that a lot of companies actually have these problems. So for example, vehicle routing problem is extremely common. For example, supermarkets, retail stores, uh, restaurant chains, uh, uh, for example, freight transportation, buses, taxis, airlines, uh, technicians that you have to send on the road to help people out with, 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 with your product at, at on sites. Uh, it's all vehicle routing. So there's a very big area of use cases in a uh, multitude of of, uh, uh, of areas um, that can really benefit from optimizing on vehicle routing. Uh, another example is employee rostering, for example, where you have to increase your employees' well-being. So this could be something for uh, nurse rostering or assignment of security guards or uh, police departments, fire departments, and so forth. Uh, constraints could be that you only can work one shift per day. You have to have required skills for that specific shift. Uh, might be that you want to go on vacation and that you request days off. That has implications for a, uh, a sh schedule. That has implications for roster. And Auto Planner can also help you with creating those kind of plans and optimizing those kind of plans to improve, for example, in this case, uh, employee well-being. And as I said, use cases could be hospitals. Uh, we had an in, uh, interesting employee rostering uh, uh, problem now with the COVID situation where we were able to use the existing rostering and, 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 and scheduling uh, application and add COVID-19 rules uh, or constraints uh, to that uh, to that. Uh, system to better optimize the shift assignment for nurses and doctors. So for example, not to mix people within different shifts and so forth, to minimize the contact points between different groups of people. So that's also an interesting uh, uh, constraint in this use case that, that's sort of very applicable actually in, this, uh, in these times. Um, and what you need to know is that OptoPlanner is not a, uh, a, a single purpose or a single use case uh, uh, product. It, 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 it looks at, it optimizes, it's created to optimize various sorts of, of problems. And these problems are, are everywhere. If you have a more of an IT or, or, or a mathematic academic background, you might have heard of uh, a problem space called MP complete or MP hard problems. And, and what we know from that space is that you can basically transform any of those those uh, problems into one another. And an OptoPlanner can solve, uh, once you configure and, and implement correctly, can solve various of these problems, like job shop scheduling, vehicle routing, bin packing, equipment scheduling, uh, and so forth and so forth. So it's uh, applicable in a uh, lot of vertical industries and in, in a lot of use cases. 
So that for a short introduction about OptiPlanner and the, uh, the value proposition, I'm sure you will hear more about that in the remainder of this week and the other talks as well. Uh, but let's now look at the uh, at, at some of the things that I have seen uh, personally with a number of my colleagues. I actually see them uh, in, the, in the chat right here. Hello, Paolo. Uh, uh, some of the things that we've seen at uh, at uh, at customers and and where we think where we came in as as Red Hat as a company as we uh, uh, provide support for uh, for OptiPlanner within our offerings, where we came in to uh, uh, use our consulting and and help uh, all uh, uh, our customers to uh, improve their OptiPlanner projects and some of the problems we've seen in the past. So there's uh, these are the topics that I want to go through. Uh, first of all, the domain modeling. We're going to look a bit at the benchmarker, a different score calculation type, environment, environment modes, and so forth and so forth. It's a quick overview, and we'll dive into more detail on these topics. So first of all, domain modeling. As I said before, AutoPlanner is a general purpose constraint solver. So it's an artificial intelligence. It, a constraint solving is a subsection of, of AI. So a lot of people think that AI is equivalent to machine learning. Well, it's actually not. Uh, Constraint solvers, which is the category of technology that, that OptiPlanner falls into, is also a subset of, of AI focused at solving these unsolvable problems, so to say. So what you need to do in an OptiPlanner project is actually model your problem domain. So in vehicle routing, there could be vehicles. In, in a shift assignment, that could be employees. It could be shifts. Uh, it could be skill sets, and so forth and so forth. And what we see, and this is already a, not a very high level slide, I have to say, but what I want to point out here is that depending on the domain model that you choose, depending on the model uh, that you, you create, you can create either bad models or, or good models. And, and bad models usually are models that are ideally, either create a, uh, a problem space or a solution space that is too big. So even with OptiPlanner, there are models that create a solution space in which there's so many combinations of a, of a solution that even a a a, a library or, or or a technology like OptiPlanner can't solve that anymore. That that is possible, uh, but it can also cause that you create a solution space that's so big that you really don't get the the the, the benefit and the value out of OptiPlanner that you could have if you would have chosen a model which would be better applicable for your use case, where you would have a a smaller solution space so OptiPlanner can give you a better optimization of your problem at hand. Uh, this is one of the slides that actually comes out of the uh, Opti planner uh, uh, um, I think it's the off the planner learning slides around there on off the .org. And what we see here is that this is for in this example we're looking at the shift assignment problem or the employee rostering problem and what we can see here is that basically depending on how we choose what kind of entity in our model is the planning entity and which one is the planning variable we can create either a model that or in which the solution space is way too big, or a model that's actually a good model and that gives us the best results. So again, I will not go into details here, but there's there's more research. Actually, the OptiPlanner manual has a very, very good section about domain modeling. So when you start embarking on your OptiPlanner journey, you start writing your domain model, this is one of the more most critical things that you have to get right. So make sure that you invest time into this, make sure that you analyze your problem, make sure that you analyze this, the space of your solution, the number of combinations of your, of, your, uh, of your planning problem to make sure that you create the best model possible. And even us experts sometimes have trouble uh, 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 getting that model right. So even under ourselves within our organization, we, we tend to ask for feedback when we've designed, designed a model and say, well, can you have a second look here and, and, and maybe give some tips and tricks on, on how to improve this. Um, so I'll go not go into, into detail about this, uh, this slide, but what, what is uh, uh, um, interesting is that if you look at the solution space or the search space for an OptiPlanner project, uh, the numbers, really are mind-blowing. So for example, if you look at, so 
this is an example of a uh, uh, a cloud balancing problem where you have to assign a number of computer processes to a number of computers with a certain set of resources. And this slide we show that if you have 300 computer processes that you can assign to 100 different computers, the actual number of possible con combinations is 100 to the power of 300. Um, that's equivalent to 10 to the power of 600. And that really doesn't probably tell you anything. Uh, but if you uh, know that the number of uh, atoms in the observable universe is 10 to the power of 80, so 10 to the power of 80, and you see that this problem already has a solution space of 10 to the power of 600, you can sort of see how important it is to not make that solution space any bigger than is, uh, than is necessary. And the size of the search space for different domains, for different domain models is, is, is different. So here's an example for cloud balancing, uh, an example for the traveling salesman problem, which is uh, basically n factorial. And for the course set scheduling uh, one, it's uh, in this case a period times the room uh, to the power of the lectures, I think. Um, so that's the first one, get your domain model right. Uh, uh, so that's really a critical thing uh, in an OptiPlanner project. And we're always happy to help you uh, 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 with any questions you have there and also uh, 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 and to consult the experts when you have questions there. But as I said, the OptiPlanner manual has a very good guide on doing the domain modeling. Duncan, tell you. Yes. Uh, we have a question here that I think that you'll be able to address. So first of all, yes, everyone, I'll grab these slides from Duncan after he finishes and I'll share it with you. And second, uh, can you give like a list of vendors who would be able to help this person uh, implement his solution? He's like looking for OptiPlanner to be used for assigning order to multiple vendors, for example. Do you know someone that can help him maybe? Well, well, obviously we work for Red Hat, and the uh, the OptiPlanner project is a is a Red Hat sponsor sp sponsored project. So, if you want to get consulting from and help from from the people that have done this before at various customers, I can say for ourselves that we've done this before. And second is that. Uh, um, is that the OptiPlanner uh, developers and the project leads are uh, Red Hat employees, or most of them are Red Hat employees. So I can say for ourselves, we provide consulting services to uh, to help you uh, get your project started. Perfect. So, Thank you, Duncan. Yeah. You're welcome. Good. Uh, benchmarker. This is an interesting one. So a lot of people, uh, as with a lot of tech, you don't always read the manual, right? You get the, you can, uh, you get started, and you download the the the, uh, the project, and you start coding. You look at it, a bunch of examples, and off you go. Um, the one thing that I that I always tell my customers that they have to do on day two of their OptiPlanet project, because day one is you get to meet your colleagues and, and you have a, a coffee, a good lunch, and you uh, you create the agenda, the team and your backlog and so forth and so forth. Uh, day two is uh, please, even be, maybe even before you start coding, uh, start creating your benchmark. So what's the benchmark? The benchmarker actually is a uh, a, a component within the OptiPlanet project that you can feed with uh, a solver configuration, so a configuration of your OptiPlanet um, uh, uh, library, your OptiPlanet solver. Uh, so OptiPlanet can run into in multiple different configurations. You can can run multiple different algorithms, different configurations of algorithms, termination strategies, uh, and so forth. So there's a lot of uh, different dials that you can that you can uh, can can turn. Um, what the benchmarker does is you can feed it uh, one or more uh, OptiPlanet configurations, and you can feed it your uh, domain model, so you're the actual code of your project that defines what your planning entity, what your planning variable and uh, your data, so the, your data sets. So that could be a small data set, a medium data set, and a large data set. What the benchmark does, it runs all these data sets against all these different solver configurations, and it will give you an output in an HTML report that shows you the performance of the solver for these different data sets with these different configurations. And I really, really, really advise everybody that's going to do an OptiPlanet project, start investing in the benchmark from day two, really do. Even if you have nothing else or you don't have a lot else or you're starting with just 
analyzing an example or anything like that, invest time in making sure that you've got this thing set up. That is on your on your calendar. So this is what it looks like. So this is an example of a benchmark that shows, in this case, for a, a soft score calculation, what the score progression over time is for your uh, uh, your problem. So what you usually see in an OptiPlanner project is a graph that looks like this. It's a graph of diminishing returns. So you see a lot of optimization in the first uh, and improvement of the score of your solution in the first couple of minutes. Uh, and for larger problems, say, let's say the first 10, 15, uh, 30 minutes of, of calculation. But then you get into sort of this limit function where you reach a point of diminishing returns. This is what you want to see. The problem is that if you don't implement a benchmarker and you don't uh, get these kind of uh, uh, graphs and you, you're not aware of the, the, the score calculation and the improvement of your, your solver over time, you really can't tell if you are implementing the, your OptiPlanner project the way you want to implement it. For example, I have been at a customer where uh, I didn't see a graph like this. Uh, first of all, I asked them, do you run the benchmarker? So their question to me was, what's the benchmarker? Uh, so then you already know that you have to invest some time there because you're basically blind and you can't see what your project is actually doing. So what we saw there is that we saw a flatliner. So just a flat line, no limit function or nothing, flat line. So what that means is that OptiPlanner is not improving any scores whatsoever. So it's crunching and crunching and crunching and applying all these heuristic matter heuristic algorithms to your problem, but you're not improving the solution of your of your of your score. You're not the, you're not improving the score of your solution. So what that means, well, it can have multiple uh, uh, causes, but uh, usually that means that, as I said before, your solution space might be too large. You might have too many planning entities. You might plan want to plan for too uh, long of a period of time. So in this case, the use case was uh, planning. It was like a shift assignment planning for uh, the entire UK. So that's uh, uh, England, uh, Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland, Wales, uh, but for six months. So they wanted to plan in advance all these assignments for six months. And that created such a large problem for that entire country uh, that we just got a, 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 a flatliner uh, on, this, uh, on this graph. So the obvious solution then is, well, try to uh, create a smaller problem. Do you really need to plan six months in advance, advance or is one month enough? Do you really need to plan the entire country? Because you probably know that a person that lives in Northern Ireland will never be assigned to a shift somewhere in London. So there's a lot of tricks there and a lot of things that you can do to make sure that you're creating a solution space that is manageable by something like OptiPlanner. And the benchmarker is one way to find out if your solver is doing what it should be doing. Uh, other examples uh, that we teach in our course as well uh, is our RD. So the first one uh, is uh, basically a performance bottleneck. When you see a graph like this, it basically means that the score is constantly, constantly improving, which it really shouldn't. It, it really should, well, it should constantly improve, but it should show this line of diminishing returns. Here, you just know that you're not giving your OptiPlanner uh, 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 your OptiPlanner process enough resources, enough compute to actually improve the score. So it could be that your score calculation count is too slow and so forth, or that you have made a mistake somewhere in your application, what, which causes the calculation to be extremely slow, or you don't have enough compute. That could be the case as well. Um, the, the second one is interesting as well, where you see all these, these jumps. Uh, that usually means that it's, it gets stuck in a local Optima somewhere, and that by coincidence, it's able to jump out of that. So we've got solutions there as well to maybe start using different moves, more coarse grain custom moves to make sure you don't get stuck in these, these local optimas. Maybe use another algorithm as well. Um, and the last one, as I said, uh, that's sort of the law of diminishing returns. That that looks really nice. If I see a graph like that in an OptiPlanner project on the benchmarker, I'm usually quite happy. Um, uh, but there, you could also then try to use other benchmark uh, or benchmark other algorithms, power tweak the algorithms you're using, just to get that extra one two percent uh, uh, out of your solution. As 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 we have seen, an extra one two percent could easily be a million bucks. So it 
could be worthwhile to at least spend a couple, couple of minutes to try some different configuration settings there. Um, so the benchmarker, super important. Don't forget that, set it up from day two. First day, coffee and uh, meet your team. Second day, set up the benchmarker. Um, it also allows you to see which algorithm you should choose. So as I said, OptiPlanner comes with multiple algorithms, multiple uh, meta-heuristic algorithms to uh, uh, solve your problem. Like there is taboo search, simulated annealing, late acceptance, and so forth. And we often get the question, which algorithm should I use for my specific problem? And there's not a, a rule for that. There's not, not, not a, a silver bullet. And, and uh, as my grandfather, who was in construction, always used to say, measuring is knowing. And that's the case with OptiPlanner as well. So also there, the benchmark is important. You can feed it with different data sets and different algorithms might, might react different to different data or might provide different output for different data sets uh, in terms of performance. So again, there, make sure you provide a data set that you're going to use in production or a data set that's like a data set that you're going to use in production. Use the benchmarker, different configurations, and pick the best algorithm for your specific problem. Score calculation types. That's another interesting one uh, and an, a common pitfall. Um, so. Basically, AutoPlanner provides a number of ways to define how you calculate a score. So what's a score? Uh, basically, what you need to have is that when OptiPlanner has found a solution to your problem, uh, it needs to be able to compare that uh, deterministically with another, with the score of another solution. So you define score functions or score rules uh, to define the score of that specific solution. So for example, you can, uh, when you have a, a um, uh, a constraint that somebody can only drive maximum eight hours consecutively, and a solution has a driver that uh, has to drive eight and a half hours consecutively, then you can penalize that solution with a 30 minutes um, a negative soft constraint, as we call it. Now, we OptiPlanner provides different ways of implementing that, that score calculation. So the first one is what we call simple Java. Um, and simple Java, uh, basically, I'm not sure if we've got it on the next slide. Yeah, let's, let's look at that. So simple Java uh, uh, is, is very easy to write. Um, it, it basically grabs your entire uh, solution and it calculates a score from scratch. So it, it grabs the whole solution, goes through all the planning entities and variables and starts to to uh, uh, calculate that score. It's very easy to write. Uh, it's just that it's extremely, extremely, extremely slow because it calculates everything from scratch. So do not use that for production. If you start writing your score rules in simple Java, we can guarantee you that you will not be satisfied with the outcome of the solutions that OptiPlanner gives you. And it's, and it's way uh, below what you can, uh, of the potential of, of OptiPlanner. Then we've got incremental Java. Um, incremental Java, and here's the thing, uh, the manual actually says uh, it's very hard to write. We do not recommend people to use this. However, um, we see a lot of customers actually thinking they're smarter than the OptiPlanner manual and think that it well, maybe it's not that hard. I'm a very, very good engineer. I can pull that off. Um, usually what happens is this, that they paint themselves in the corner. Um, it's very hard to write a incremental score calculation. So basically, to give you an example, what, what incremental score calculation does is OptiPlanner works by starting from a certain solution and then applying a change to that solution that we call a move, and then we then we reach another solution, and then we calculate the score for that next solution and compare it with the previous one to see which one is better. It's more sophisticated than that, but that's that's the the general concept of it. Um, what we do in incremental score calculation is that we don't co uh, calculate the score from scratch, but calculate delta between those two different solutions so we only have to calculate a little piece and be a lot faster in score calculation. So you can do that in Java with increment Java. However if you make a mistake in your uh, score calculation you get into something that we call score corruption and score corruption leads to a solution that's uh, uh, completely invalid. Duncan. The other problem is that it's uh, also very hard to maintain. It's very hard to implement individual score rules in uh, incremental Java. So also here the recommendation, like with simple Java, don't use it. 
I'm sorry, I would like to ask you just to repeat this last part because the internet, I think that the connection was a little bit shaky. So just this last uh, explanation would be fit. Okay. Okay, thank uh, you. Then the question is, was Karina's internet shaky or was my internet shaky? <laughs> I think it was yours. <laughs> I was checking yeah, it. You're sure? You're sure? Oh, that's weird. Uh, then my kids are probably watching Netflix in 4K or Disney Plus. You never know. Um, so, yeah, no, well, incremental Java, what it actually means is that, well, you write an incremental uh, score calculation, which says, well, I've got a solution here with a score. I move to another solution by applying a small change within that solution. And I only uh, calculate the delta of that uh, of that score. So you don't have to calculate the entire problem from scratch or the, the score for the entire solution from scratch. You only calculate the delta. That's very hard to write. It's also very hard to maintain. So uh, the the um, uh, adding additional constraints or changing constraints is actually very very hard. It's also error prone. So if you make a mistake there, you can get uh, score corruption. Score corruption leads to an invalid uh, solution. So your solution is basically useless. So again, not recommended. I've seen too many customers that use it and then ha they have to retrofit something else uh, uh, after two months of development. And that's, uh, 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 that's uh, not, never a good thing. Okay, luckily the internet is connection be is better. I'm on fiber here, so that shouldn't be the problem. So I blame some uh, some other component in the network. Um, so the other one score calculation types are DRL. So that's the rule, rule language. Um, that's incremental by default. That's how that engine works. Uh, so in the past, that this was always the, the, the go-to uh, uh, type of score calculation. We always advise to use DRL. The problem with DRL, the is that there is a learning curve. So if you don't know rules, if you don't know how to write declarative rules in a rules engine, uh, DRL does have a learning cur curve. Once you get it, once you're familiar with rules, it's relatively easy to write. But that's, I'm opinionated because I've been using rules for the last, I think, nine years. Uh, so once you're familiar with rules, actually adding constraints and removing constraints and changing constraints is relatively easy because they're all declarative de de defined in their own space. Um, as I said, it's fast. It has uh, implicit incremental calculation. Uh, what we tend to advise users nowadays, and what users and especially Java developers seem to like more nowadays, is the new Java streams like API, which is called Constraint Streams. Uh, Lukash uh, will tell uh, more about Constraint Streams in his talk. I'm not sure which day that is. Uh, um, tomorrow or the day after, not sure. You have to look at the agenda, but Lukash will talk uh, more in uh, detail and depth about uh, Constraint Streams. Um, it uses drills under the covers. Uh, it's a Java streams like API. It's relatively easy to write if you're familiar with the Java streams API and it's fast. Under the covers, it uses drills, so it uh, has implicit incremental calculation. So make sure from day one, you choose the right score calculation type. Um, Environment modes. This is a great one as well. This is what we do in consulting also in day one and we impress everybody and everybody's super happy that we came and gives us free beer and stuff. Um, so are there bugs in my code? Especially when uh, customers start writing their own uh, incremental Java calculation type. This is something that we switch on a lot. So there's uh, a number of assert mode or, or environment modes in OptiPlanner that not a lot of people know about because they don't read the manual, uh, but that we really recommend to switch on from time to time, say once a week or twice a week, just do a run with one of the assert modes on. Um, Basically, what they do in, in general is that apart from the incremental calculation, they will also uh, do things like a full calculation of a new solution and, 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 and compare those two scores, which should be similar. They should be the same. So it's able to detect bugs in your code. It's able to detect bugs in your rules. It's able to detect bugs in your uh, score calculation and so forth. As I said before, score corruption is bad. Score corruption leads to uh, an investment balance uh, solution. So make sure that every now and then you set up this environment mode. You make sure that you run, at least run a fast assert. But if you can, it, it slows down the engine tremendously because it does all these extra calculations and starts comparing things with each other. But make sure that every now and then 
at least once a week, you run a faster cert or maybe even a full cert mode, just to make sure that your project is still in, in optimal condition, that you haven't don't have any bugs in your code and, and cor score corruption and so forth. Um, so this is how you do that. It's a bit of XML uh, uh, in the uh, the solver configuration. Set it to full assert, and you're uh, you're all done. Also important, keep the user in control. So this is what we've seen at customers as well, where there's usually this. Um, well, since every every customer already has a planning problem, the planning problems they already have, everybody has that vehicle routing problem, but usually it's up till now uh, implemented by uh, humans. They use Excel spreadsheets or maybe an application that was built somewhere years ago. Uh, but there is usually a team that is responsible for these uh, for this planning and and for these plans and these these rosters. Make sure you keep the user in control from day one. Make sure you involve that team and don't be the cocky IT guy that has got this new shiny toy called OptiPlanner and will show you how bad you have been doing this planning all these years and that can, I can do it much better than what you've been uh, doing for the last 10 years. Look at me and how good I am. Don't do that. That will fill your project from day one because what you need is you need buy-in from the business. You need to show these people, not that you're replacing them by a very smart shell script, you need to show these people that you're giving them a new cool tool, a new thing that can improve their work, that can help them do their job even better than they are already doing. And why do you need that? Why do you need to keep that user in control? It's very simple. You think as an IT guy, and every IT guy thinks this, you think that you know the problem that you're trying to solve. But let me tell you, there's domain experts that have been doing this for years that have a lot more domain knowledge, especially around really specific things uh, in that domain that you will never know because you don't, you haven't worked in that area uh, uh, for the last, you haven't seen all the changes. So usually you get a lot of information from the, the, these domain experts. What does the domain model look like? What is this kind of thing that's called a schedule? Or what is this kind of thing called a shift? How do you define that? What is an employee? What is a skill? Can you have both skills at the same time? If I have both skills at the same time, do I only need one person on that shift that requires both skills? Or do I still need two people uh, uh, because I need two people that have those skills filled? Those kind of things are super, super important when you start defining both your domain model and your constraints. So get them involved quickly from day one, make them important. The second thing is setting planning priorities, right? So you might think, yeah, I, I want to optimize everything based on time or based on customer satisfaction or based on money or based on ecological footprint. But usually there are trade-offs within a planning problem. So make sure that you understand the trade-offs and that you let the business people stay in control and control the trade-offs and make sure that they control which trade-offs are made within the solution. And the other thing is visualize and publish. So don't start with creating this super shiny React.js web app that's running on your mobile devices and what have you to show all your nice planning things. Make sure that from day one, you can do that at a later stage, but from day one, make sure that you provide the output of your solutions in a format that the business can read. Why? Because they need you need them on board to validate that the outcome of your solution is correct that there are no things that, that are, are wrong or that, that are basically wrong in your model or in your constraints. So usually what we say is Excel is actually often a very good choice to start with. Just output your planning solution in Excel and provide that to the business and ask them, is this valid? Is this, this, is this correct? Is this a good solution? Uh, is this, is this, can we implement this? So Another thing that we say to keep the user in control is, is allow them, we have got a feature called pinning planning entities, allow them to pin planning entities. What this means is that they can say, well, I want to uh, assign this process to this computer, or this shift has to be at that time and it has to be filled in by this employee, and OptiPlanner can't touch it. We know that that will not reach the optimal solution, <clears throat> but you keep the user in control because there might be a valid reason why they want to do that. So keep the user in control and we provide features in OptiPlanner to do that. Uh, for example, pinning planning entities. The other things that we do is uh, the uh, constraint weights. So based on the score 
functions that you provide, we tend to give weights to certain constraints. So as I said before, if you have like a, a, a driving time that goes be, uh, beyond something in the constraints, you can say, well, we do a minus 30 soft score. If you weigh those constraints, then you can have the, the stakeholder decide on what the platform should optimize on. For example, in this example, you can have a quality stakeholder that focuses on the load on a certain machine uh, versus the financial stakeholder that focuses completely on cost. So by having these constraint weights that we can implement using constraint configurations in the platform, uh, you can give the control over those weights to a user and they can make the decision uh, what's more important in this case, uh, uh, the cost or something else. And visualization, as I said, we have another uh, number of examples that do that in Excel. That's usually very useful. Uh, and when you go further in your project, we usually see that the, 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 the platform, the solutions get embedded in the more sophisticated tools with web UIs. We've seen sort of app store like concepts at, at, a, at an airliner at a, some point. That was an interesting idea of how to present those, uh, those solutions. There are multiple options, but make sure you visualize in a way that's understandable by your stakeholders. Explaining the score. Uh, sorry? Kind of interrupting as usual. Before as you move forward. forward. <laughs> I can interrupt you. You're good. So yeah, are your visualization tools like easy to use, Duncan? So the thing is, Optoplanner doesn't provide any uh, visualization tools in the project uh, uh, itself. But what we do is we're a Java-based API. So what we tend to do is that that we um, allow integration with any form of, of, of tool, uh, with any form of data format that we can uh, can uh, expose. So we, you can use JSONB, you can use Jackson or whatever you want, if you want to use uh, uh, JSON formats and so forth. You can implement this as a service. You can implement the UI that fetches this from a data store and so forth. So we don't have a very opinionated uh, say in what kind of UI uh, you have to use. What we do have, and I think Yuri will talk about this, is that we've got a number of sort of template projects that provide a UI of the, out of the box. For example, we have got one for vehicle routing, which is an important use case uh, for OptiPlanner, uh, in which we've seen um, a, a lot of customer success, actually, uh, a, a large customer of ours that is saving, I think, $220 million a year, uh, basically using a vehicle routing uh, solution uh, with OptiPlanner. We provide a, a template application for that, including a UI uh, out of the box with, uh, with the project. Uh, I think we the other one is for employees you rostering. So we do provide some UIs, uh, but if you want to implement your own, obviously um, uh, everything is available to uh, to integrate your own UI technology. Okay, thank you. Just a reminder, you have eight minutes at yeah, max. I, yeah, 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 at max, I'll, I'll speed up a bit. Uh, I'll optimize a bit. So I'm not going to go too much into explaining the score because uh, this will be covered in other sessions today. Uh, but basically what explaining the score means is that based on a certain a solution that OptiPlanner finds, uh, we can actually uh, infer uh, what kind of uh, constraints and what kind of uh, uh, rules led up to that specific score and which uh, planning entities and which objects were involved in getting that uh, uh, or creating that score. So you can see uh, uh, which um, parts of your solution are suboptimal and which actually uh, are, uh, are are causing that score to to be what it what it is. Uh, especially when you've got hard uh, score uh, violations, uh, be so, uh, they, that can usually be a good indication that you're missing certain resources. You don't have enough vehicles. You don't have enough, enough teachers with a certain skill. You don't have enough nurses with a certain skill. Or they're not available in the right time and so forth. So explaining the solution is extremely important, also for decision makers within the organization that want to know why you can't come up with a, a, a um, an optimal solution uh, or a feasible uh, solution in this case, if you break hard constraints. So visualization, again, explanation, uh, and we're gonna get more into trust the AI uh, and, 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 and explainability uh, in the next sessions is extremely important as well. Reproducibility. Uh, this is a bit more technical, uh, but reproducibility is key, uh, not only for your own sanity, uh, but uh, also when you want to contact support, when you want to uh, contact uh, the project leads, uh, the community and so forth. Uh, so basically every run that Autoplanner does is, is reproducible. So it takes 
every single time it takes the same steps. So if you apply the same data set to the same solver configuration, all the steps that it does um, is reproducible. So it will be the exact same every time. So this is interesting when you find a bug somewhere that we can reproduce the exact same thing uh, in, an own, in our own OptoPlanner one when we try to reproduce your uh, your problem. There are some caveats though. Uh, there's, there's some pitfalls. And, and usually the first ones, People don't really get in, tend to get involved with that one too much, but the second and the third one are important. We see a lot of people that write their domain model that use HashMap, and iteration uh, over HashMap is not uh, non-deterministic. It's not reproducible. So what we always say when you define your domain model, if you need to use HashMap, if you need to use HashSet, use the linked HashMap and the linked HashSet implementation because iterating over those uh, uh, implementations of HashMap and HashSet is deterministic and is reproducible. So, so that's that's really a, a key thing in the domain modeling part. Use linked HashMap, use linked HashSet, uh, um, and so forth. Um, yeah, so as I said, it's gold for debugging, support, demos, and obvious, obviously your and our uh, sanity uh, as well. Um, so that was basically it uh, and all I had. Uh, and those were some of the key pointers that we have for uh, for starting your the planner project. We'll make the slides available. Uh, we can chat later in the in the in the chat to have more discussion on certain topics if you want to have more information about that. Uh, some resources. Um, the OptiPlanner website, obviously OptiPlanner.org. Um, some of the slides that you've seen here, especially around the domain modeling one, uh, are in the learning slides. So you can uh, reference those. We'll make these available as well. But those slides put that uh, topic a bit more into uh, into context. Uh, the domain modeling guide is, is is very important and very interesting. And if you start an OptiPlanner project, I really, really recommend you to read that. And Geoffrey, uh, a while ago, uh, actually a couple of years ago already, uh, wrote a, a blog about seven ways to fill your optimization project, uh, which this talk was a bit inspired on. The, the, the blog goes into, uh, I think, a more technical depth and, and addresses a number of more technical uh, pitfalls uh, rather than the organizational pitfalls that I've, uh, that I've uh, uh, shown you today. So that was sort of what I've had for today.